It uh, looks like I've got, oh uh, yes, I have reading schedules coming in the door here. This is something that uh, my wife grilled me about many times. She said, what are we supposed to have read? What are we supposed to have read? I said, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, so those are coming right now. Uh, but before we get started, let's uh, pray. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Yeah, come on in. I'm already on Genesis 12. We gotta, you know, <laughs> we're moving. <laughs> Good morning. How wonderful. We have so many people who are going to go through. We have 85 people signed up to read through the Bible in a year. I think that that's very healthy. I think that that's wonderful. And I hope that you all make it all the way through. If you fall off the wagon for a little bit, find a weekend and make, get, up, get back up to speed. We're so thankful for the uh, many men in our parish who have offered to, to teach on Sunday yeah, morning. Yeah, uh, there's good. several of them. And uh, you won't just see uh, uh, Matt. You'll see uh, Robbie Andreessen and, and Matt Frazier and, and others uh, have taken, uh, uh, volunteered to do some of the teaching. So very thankful for all of that. You have, you'll, you'll have this morning, all your readings. This is, at, this is the packet of readings. And this is, uh, you'll see that today, 9, 10, there's nothing. That's right, you're off the hook for the day. <laughs> Tomorrow, day one, 9-11, kind of off the ditches right up there. Nine, a, a day one, and you'll see all the readings going across. And so you'll, you'll, and then every Sunday's listed down here, so you kind of get an understanding as to where the teacher will be uh, when, uh, when he starts on Sunday morning. So make sure that you have this packet. Uh, Joanne has, uh, is handing them out this morning. Uh, and, and, uh, but make sure you have this packet as we go forward from here. Thank you very much for taking this uh, challenge, for accepting this challenge. And uh, I will pray for you daily. And I will pray that I, I fix 85 uh, stakes one year from now. I will personally buy them and I will personally put them to order. And I look forward to that afternoon. We've done that. Be I've done this before, so I know what I'm talking about. So I look forward to that. So God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate sure. it. Sure. All right. Well, uh, like Father Ralph said, I'm first up. I'll be here for the next four weeks. We're going to cover Genesis and Job. If you're doing the math right now in your head, you're like, well, there's a lot of chapters in Genesis and Job put together for four weeks. And that's true. Uh, I'm not going to be going verse by verse or even chapter by chapter. Uh, it's going to be like a sort of an overview, like a major themes overview sort of a thing. So if you're really looking to dig into, you know, Laban's household idols and how they were taken away by his daughter and, you know, th that kind of stuff's not going to be a thing that we talk about. You know, it's just not the first thing that we think of. Um, so why Genesis and Job? Why are they, why are they put together? Um, how do they go together? It's probably just because Job is very old. Uh, it's probably um, taking place either in the time of Abraham, maybe even a little before Abraham, but right around that same time. And there's a couple of clues in the book that let us know that it is very old. Uh, number one, Job, or Job, yes, Job offers um, sacrifices for his family. There's no mention of a priesthood, no Levites, no written law, anything like that. And there's another uh, uh, passage that talks about Job leaving an inheritance for his daughters. And under Moses' law, you don't leave inheritances for daughters, not when you have sons. And Job had sons and daughters. So we know that this takes place before the law anyway. Not going to talk about Job today. That's, uh, that's probably on uh, week four, unless, I, unless things go crazy and I, and I change my mind. Uh, the way that I'm going to talk about these books is I'm just going to use the fathers to talk about them. How are these uh, books understood from a very long time ago? You know, I've read contemporary thought on, on these, but uh, I'm much more interested in how were, you know, um, 
Ambrose and and St. Jerome and St. Augustine, how are they thinking about these books? That, I think that's more interesting. Okay. Well, I can I can shout, or I, I will try to I'll try to shout louder. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I should say, yeah. Who wrote uh, Who wrote Genesis? The fathers, the ones that I'm using, they unquestioningly assume that Moses wrote it. That's not a controversial thing for them. That's not uh, that was not up for debate. They'll just say when Moses said. Uh, now. You know, there's all kinds of theories of who wrote this, when was it written, was it written in the, during the exile, was it written after the exile to Babylon, you know, there's the different, um, like, authors are, are presumed for, for uh, Genesis. I'm not going to get into that even a little bit. Um, this is the last I'm going to talk about it. I will just assume with the fathers that Moses wrote it. I, I don't know. I don't know that it's terribly important. But um, I think that what I want to start with, I, I'm just going to assume we're all very familiar with Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I don't think we have to, I, I, we can read it, but um, I'd like to just talk about what's going on in the first couple chapters of Genesis. It's obviously the creation story. And, uh, you know, right on page one, we land in controversy. Uh, uh, pretty stiff controversy, actually, depending on where you're from. I grew up. How did I grow up? I grew up independent Baptist, Southern Baptist, free will Baptist, lots of flavors of Baptist. Um, they're all united in one thing on this, though. Uh, Genesis is the creation account is very literal. Six literal um, days of creation, how it happened. Anything else besides that is from Satan. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's bad. That's how I grew up. I, I, I you too, yes, <laughs> yeah. Maggie says the same thing. So I don't know how, how most of you, uh, I don't know your backgrounds. Um, but Father Ralph asked me, he goes, you didn't grow up like that, did you? I said, absolutely. He's like, there are people still like that? I said, it's the majority report, man. <laughs> like, it's, it's, a, it's a majority report. So I want to talk about uh, how do we read the first couple of chapters of Genesis. And I'm going to do this the way that I do it for my students at school. I teach a natural history. And so whenever I talk about lizards and snakes and birds and stuff, I'll say, well, these lizards are in the same family, or they're closely related to this family. And so immediately the kids want to know, like, what on earth are you talking about? So the way that I understand it, there are four different ways to think about creation. Three of them you are free to think about as a Christian and remain a Christian in good standing. One of them, you're free to think this way, but you cannot remain a Christian and think uh, this way. So I'm just going to lay them out. And I, I'm not going to try to jostle you or move you in, in one way or the other. I'll just give you the, the, like the very broad brush understanding of these. And I, I should say something about that. I'm going to give these, these views, and I am painting with a very broad brush. I'm not getting nuance at all. And it's going to rankle some of you. So by, by uh, training, my, my master's degree is in printmaking. And, and in printmaking, I make lino cuts, which are very much like wood cuts. It, it, it requires a, a knowledge of tools and processes and, and the way inks work and paper, you know, and all of this to get good prints. But when I tell people about it, they say, oh, stamps. And I say, <laughs> I, take, I take a deep breath and I say, yeah, okay, that's, <laughs> you know. So stamps is a very broad brush, but it's reasonably accurate, okay? so. <laughs> I'm going to paint broad brush. All right, all right, so the nuances and everything, I'm sorry if it, if it bothers you. So, all right, so the first, the first way you could think about creation, you could think about it as an atheist materialist. This is the one you can't think and still be a Christian, okay? It's a perfectly um, common way to think about the world. Many, many people do. Many wildly intelligent people think about it this way. You'll be in good company. You just won't be in the company of Christians if you think this. So uh, option one, I'm not writing with this one. Atheist materialist. So what does an atheist materialist believe? Uh, 
no God. So we part company there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, everything, the entire universe is somewhere. It, it, it shifts and changes here and there, but somewhere in the realm of 15 billion years old, as far as we can tell. Uh, Earth, uh, let's see here, Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Um, these numbers, I, I say these numbers, billion, what's a billion? It's like a million. No, it's a lot more than a million. Like it's, it's very, very difficult. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his book, The Discarded Image. The medievals had this idea of space being like a million miles out or something. And he says, well, what do we think? 15 billion light years away? He's like, what's the difference? Your mind can't tell the difference anyway. It's a long way, you know? So <laughs> these are, this, is, this is a very, very long time. Um, the Bible equals fiction. Um, myth in the most common sense that we mean myth. Let's see here. I, I'll come back to flood in these other three uh, um, points here. Flood is myth. Um, li all life evolves. Okay, it's, it's just what you think it was. Um, this, is, this is not uncommon. I mean, everybody knows this stuff, right? So, no God, uh, the universe 15 billion years old, Earth's four and a half billion years old, the Bible is just another ancient document like all of the other ones. Got some neat stories in it that kind of result, you know, um, that we kind of respond to. Uh, there was no flood, certainly no universal flood. That's a myth. Um, all life has evolved from non-life. And here we are. Enjoy the game today, I guess. You know? Yeah, right, right, right. So that's one way to look at things. Um, that's the one you can't believe and still be a Christian. All right. Second option here, and this is, like I said, majority report. Young Earth, uh, creationism, all right, Young Earth creationism, and like I say, this is the way I grew up. This is Henry Morris, the, the, the flood hypothesis of everything. Um, there's, there's a really fascinating book by Ronald Numbers called The Creationists. He talks about the history of creationism. It's about 100 years old. There were no creationists before that, at least not in the way that we think about them. Um, let's see here, young earth creationism. The earth is, the whole universe is six to 10,000 years old. Six to 10,000 years old. That's a lot less than 15 billion. All right, I remember, uh, 6,000, when I was very young, was the majority report. And then they said, well, there's some room, maybe 10,000. Th th they felt like that was uh, giving a little bit of, like, throwing the, the evolutionists a bone. Like, here, maybe it's 10,000. Like, that's absolutely no difference at all. You know, 6 to 10,000. <laughs> Statistically, uh, or proportionally, zero difference. Um, six, uh, everything was created in six literal days. Six 24-hour days on the seventh day God rested. Um, Bible is literally true. I, I know that literally is a, is a squirrely word. Yeah. Like, do you understand it as literature and that is the form, or literally as in that is exactly the way it happened? Literally true. Um, flood, universal. meaning the flood covered the entire world. Noah built an ark, it had hippopotamuses and giraffes and mountain goats and crocodiles. You know, everything was on there for a very long time. All right? Um, everything was on there. 
and then uh, zero, no evolution. And I'll put an asterisk besides that. Uh, no evolution, they would accept things like, we have dogs, right? Dogs are essentially wolves. Chihuahuas and Great Danes, they're all dogs. Variations on dogs. So they would accept that. Like, okay, yeah, you get variations within, within a species. You know, you get different breeds of chickens and different breeds of dogs. But a dog's always a dog. It's never another thing, ever, no matter how long you give it. Okay. So atheist materialist, young earth creationist, this is probably very familiar to you. Um, let's see, I'll just, I'll flip the board, maybe. <laughs> Third option, and this is the one where I'm gonna paint very broad brush because there's a lot of variations in this. Intelligent design, Intelligent design doesn't mean, it's not just another word for things that Christians believe, like the God of the Bible did this. It just means that there was this design in nature. They leave it completely open to whatever that designer could be or whoever it could be. This is open to Jews, Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, whoever, Hindus, you know, whatever. It's just an intelligent designer. Now, I think a lot of Christians fall into intelligent design, that, that camp, I believe. Um, yeah, probably majority report, but um, they leave it pretty open. For the most part, we're looking at a uh, 15 billion year old universe, 4.5 billion year old Earth. Uh, evolution, yes. Um, yes but with an asterisk. And here's, here's where uh, I paint with a broad brush. The idea is that yes, things go along as they're supposed to go along, but then you, every now and then you come up against like hurdles that you can't get over. Things that are so complex that they couldn't possibly have arisen with any kind of natural process. Like there's a million of them, like eyesight, you know, like what part of your eye can you do without, you know, none of them. You have to have them all there to work. So. This is a simplification, but essentially the intelligent design people look back and they say, listen, things are too complicated. This can't be a random thing. Um, there's obviously a design and intent in, in creation. Some things can't be explained any other way. God steps in maybe at some points and says, all right, things are unfolding just fine here, but I need to get involved here and then, you know, you know adjust. Now things are gonna go fine again for a very long time. Now I'm going to adjust. It depends on what intelligent designer you are, you know, where God has to step in and do things to make them, to make them work. Um, but I know a lot, of, a lot of Christians who are uh, intelligent design, for sure. Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion, right. So the Cambrian explosion, you go up to the, to the Rocky Mountains in Canada, and you start digging up rocks where there's no life, none, zero. And then all of a sudden there's lots and lots of life fossilized in the rocks and weird, weird things too that like for, um, like there's, a, there's an animal called Anomalocaris, which for years we thought was three things, we, my colleagues and I. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we discussed it now. They, okay, they thought for years were three different things like these strange shrimp things, these things that look like, like a pineapple ring, and then um, some other kind of like lobster looking thing. Well, eventually they find, you know, a whole one put together, and all three of the things are just different parts, mouth parts. The lobster part is the body. The shrimp things were actually grasping sort of mouth parts, and the, and the uh, pineapple ring was a, was a mouth, so it's one thing. Or we'll find things like hallucinogenia, I think, uh, has got spikes on one side and rubbery tube things on the other. We didn't even know for years what side was up. Were the spiky parts up and it walked on the tubes or were the spiky parts down and it had tubes waving in the air? Who knows, you know? It's, so there's some bizarre things like Father Bart said that just appear 
Now, did it appear because they, they happened suddenly, or did it appear because nothing else fossilized before, because they're all soft bodies, and soft bodies don't fossilize very well? These are the fun things that everyone rages and, and argues about. Um, so pretty much just like the normal mainstream science, except for you get to the part that get very difficult and the intelligent designers say, this is obviously design. And the atheists would say, no, it's not. We just haven't figured it out yet. Okay. And then the fourth one, <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, did you want to say something? I thought you were going like that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Theistic. Okay. Theistic evolution, and um, so again, uh, about a 15 billion year old universe, about a four and a half billion year old Earth, uh, evolution, yes because God designed it to work that way, and it did work that way. That was the plan from the beginning. So God front loads everything to work the way that he wants it to work without him having to be directly, you know, moving uh, parts and pieces around. This was always the plan, and it's worked that way. Okay? Uh, flood, maybe. Uh, I'm sure that you, you get variations in here. Some people say, oh, this is a metaphorical thing. Others like, no, it happened. It was a local thing. Um, you get flood stories from all over the whole world, and they say, well, that's, a, that's like a, a cultural or a racial memory to when this thing happened locally, right there in the Middle East in a valley or bet between mountains. Um, I even read an interesting thing. Someone said it was when the Mediterranean rushed in, you know, between North Africa and Gibraltar. Like, there used to be no sea there, and that little wall breaks down, and, the, and it takes a time to fill up. Yeah, I don't know. But um, uh, they say, no, it's a, it's a local thing. Let's see here. Flood, local, or metaphor. I think that most people, most would say it's local. Like, it's a real thing that happened. Local or metaphor, certainly not universal. That um, you would not have South American mammals showing up, no mastodons or woolly mammoths on there. It's just just a local thing. So you get whatever whatever the livestock is that's there. You know that kind of stuff shows up. And so uh, intelligent design, theistic evolution, young Earth creationists. I know all people in all of these camps. I feel free to eat dinner with them and take communion at the communion rail with all three of these. Not these guys, though. <laughs> they are not, they cannot come to the communion rail. <laughs> not allowed. So, um, y however you fall on this, that's fine with me. I don't, I don't feel the need to argue. Maybe when I was like 23, five years old. I, I, I felt much more strongly about it then. I, I wanted to fight, you know, but I don't want to do that anymore. Um, now, that being said, I do want to point out some pretty interesting structures, I think, that are happening in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Okay. Oh, all right. So that's, that's out there. I'm not asking anyone to come to any conclusions about it today. Just saying that it's there. Um, do we have an APA uh, position on this, Bishop? Well, I'll give you my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Probably pretty much like you, Matt, because I grew up like you did, but I sort of shed a lot of that and ended up with the theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, one of my other, so all of the Baptists, I was also in the uh, PCA, I was a Presbyterian for 10 years, and I, I was an elder in that church, and when you are being examined to be an elder, they ask you, do you take any exceptions to the confession or to the, the Westminster Confession of Faith or the Catechism or anything? 
we need to know what those exceptions are right now. And it was the creationist stuff that I took exception to. And they said, oh, almost everybody takes exception to that. It's okay. That, that, was, that, was, it. that, that was the easiest hurdle ever. Um, okay. So I think scriptures, uh, I read this uh, quote by Paul Claudel, I guess is his name. He says, scriptures are a treasury of symbols for no human words can capture the riches of God's grace. And this is, a, this is actually um, an argument I had with my brother, uh, I don't know, six months ago or so. We were arguing about um, movies versus books. And he was like, oh, books are clearly superior. Books are superior because you know, they, they explain things in much more detail. Movies essentially just show pictures. And I said, okay, well, you know, pictures are, <laughs> Pictures are also doing things that words can't do. We're showing things and not telling things. That's a completely different way of understanding than words. I'm not saying pictures are better. I'm just saying they're different. God gives us lots and lots of pictures. He rarely takes the time to explain those pictures. And when he does, you'll, you'll really stop and say, oh, okay. So like when David um, takes Bathsheba and you know, goes through all of that, Scripture says, and that thing which David did displeased the Lord. We don't get that a lot, actually. It's usually just narrating the story. Did God like it? Did not God not like it? You know, what happens? You know, every now and then you get that. But in Genesis, you get a lot of, a lot of pictures. Um, and I think it's our, our job to sort of sort through those things. And the fathers loved sorting through those things. Um, so what is a man? Uh, we, get this, we get this order of creation. We're at the top. We're the last thing created. You think like, man, if we're the most important, we should have been the first thing created. That's not the way that it works. We get um, that the earth was formless and void in the beginning. There's just matter. God makes the matter, and there's nothing. He slowly forms that. He gives us dark and light, air and water, land and sea. Then, you know, even though we had dark and light way back here, then, or I guess from where you're standing, then we get stars and moons and things like that. And then we get birds and fish. Then we get plants and animals. And then the very last thing we get is man, as human beings. That's the last thing we get. So you get this real interesting kind of um, six days. Go like this. So you get uh, dark and light, um, air and the sea, and then um, land and you know and water. Either you get over here, then you get stars and mo the moon. Then you need to fill up the air and the sea. You get birds and fish. Then you got to put stuff on the land, you get plants and animals. Plants and animals, and then us, we're here too. So, yeah, so why, are, why are we last? And uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you like, into, uh, Gregory of Nyssa said this, or you know, Ambrose said this, I'll just say the fathers, I'll just kind of treat them all as, as uh, interchangeable, which maybe is not wise, I don't know. Um, <laughs> We're, we're all of them, we're all of these things in us. We take all of those things. So, you know, if something goes tremendously wrong with you and you're in the hospital on life support, they'll say, what is this guy? He's a vegetable. Okay, so you've taken all life into you. You have vegetable life in you and that vegetables grow, they reproduce, they consume energy, they, you know, they uh, do all of these things. We do all of those things. Awesome. We do everything animals do. We are born, we live, we eat, we move, we reproduce, you know, we die, we do all of the things that, that animals do. So we have all of these things in us, but then we've got something else too. We have spirit, which these animals don't have. So we get to the very end, meaning that we encompass all of these things plus some. And that's important for the entire uh, for the entire arc of our, our fall and redemption, because if we, if we encompass all of these things, 
And scripture tells us very unambiguously that all of creation groans because of what we've done. So our redemption is for all of creation to be redeemed too. You know, it's also being redeemed. So this creation week, I think, is, is doing a lot of heavy lifting. It, it's much more than just like this is the way it happened. Um, you know, on Tuesday, God made this and Wednesday did that. There's a lot more stuff going on here than just an order of creation. It's, it's a symbolic order, at least, of, of creation. Um, so there's a, um, if we keep this in mind, that we encompass all of these things in ourselves, there's at least a couple of arcs. There's, you know what? Do we have a, a tissue or something here? Or a paper towel? I'll get a paper towel. Okay. There's a there's a couple arcs. Oh man, that's terrible. Okay, that's the worst. Oh, that would have been better. Okay, thanks. That's mm, yeah, pretty much the same thing. Okay. That's even worse. Okay. <laughs> that's the worst. All right, so we have creation. Then there's a fall. Then there's redemption. And then there's a consummation, or I'm going to, I'm going to go way out on a limb here and call it deification. Um, I'll do this. Consummation slash And I feel okay with this because Jesus says, you've heard it said that you're gods, right? So the psalm says that we're gods, or we will be, we'll judge angels, you know, all of these kind of things. So I'll, this is not some kind of crypto-orthodox creeping in here. I'm just saying, I think this is Christian. So we have this arc of fall to redemption, right? We fall, God redeems us. But then there's the much, much larger arc that contains the fall and redemption of creation to um, consummation. And the creation of consummation, I think, encompasses this smaller arc here of fall and redemption. Um, so insofar as we are people, human beings, and we sort of take all of this creation, or at least it's all symbolized, they're all bound up with us somehow, if we fall and we're redeemed, and if we are in Christ who made everything, and he is redeeming everything, then that means everything, all of creation, is bound for glory in the end. Right? I don't know. I think, I'm saying these words, but I think that we could think about them probably for the rest of our lives and try to figure out, you know, what exactly does that mean? Now, how is my redemption key to redeeming the entire, all of creation? I don't know. The Apostle Paul tells us that that is the case, though, so I believe him. Um, um, so what are we, you know, why is it important that we, we get this uh, creation account of, of the whole world and us? There's there's a couple things in the, in the creation account. A lot of people will point out that the biblical creation account is very, very, very similar to other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts, and it is. It's pretty similar. It's not the same, but it's, it's similar so that, you know, the, they wouldn't have seemed out of place, except our creation did not happen due to violence. You know, all of these other Near Eastern creation accounts, there's some god who rises up against another one, kills him, rips him apart, and you know, his body is the land, his blood is the seas, you know, bra literally brains are the clouds and things like that. That doesn't happen uh, with us. Uh, we're very pointedly told God made these things by his word. It's not through violence that things are created. And also, uh, we're told how people are made. And it's interesting because we're made from dust and spirit. That God formed us out of the dust, out of the mud, out of the lowest of the low things, and then he breathed into us from the breath from his own nostrils. So we're a combination of the lowest thing there is and the highest thing there is. 
put together, again, we're encompassing everything in our creation, the l from the lowest to the highest and everything in between goes into the making of us. Uh, we're made in the, the, the image and the likeness. Uh, Genesis is very clear to say that we're made in the image and in the likeness of God. And the fathers made a humongous deal out, out of that. They said, why would he say it twice? Why does Moses tell us we're made in the image and the likeness? Um, the image, they, they say, I know that this, this idea has fallen on hard times lately, I think, but uh, we're made in the image of God and that we're rational. They, like St. Augustine would just say, well, we're rational, nothing else is. I mean, it doesn't mean other things can't think. You know, I, I've seen my dog sleeping. I know she dreams. She's thinking about chasing rabbits and squirrels. I know she is, but she's not rational, you know, not like, not like we are. Yeah, so we have the logos, we have, we have the word, we are, we're able to think rationally. But then they say, you know, what is, the, what, is the, um, what is the likeness of God? And that for them was our move towards being made more like Christ. Uh, they would say that we are made in the image of God, but that Christ is the only image of God that there is. So we're made in the image of the image of God, like a kind of like one, one step removed. I don't know, that sounds pretty good to me. If, if Christ is the express image of God the Father, then we're made in the image of Christ, so the image of an image. And that as we move through our lives being sanctified, we're made into the likeness of God then, being formed more in the likeness. Um, let's see, do I want to say anything more? That, that, that idea of God breathing into us the breath of life, if we, oh, it was, I erased it. Um, the, the whole idea of going from dirt, it's, you know, dark and light, dirt, water, air, birds, fish, bugs, cattle, plants, you know, and then man, all the way at the top, we get all the way up there. To me, I, it sort of seems like you're climbing a mountain. You get to the very top, and then you can't get any further, and then God comes down and meets. It's like we're this strange mixture of spirit and matter. Uh, C.S. Lewis calls us amphibians. He's, uh, what, does he say that in screw tape letters that uh, does screw tape does screw tape say that in a, in a really derogatory way he goes these humans are amphibians they're half spirit and half you know half matter we can't really understand them but we are we're part spirit and, and we're part matter it's a strange thing okay i'm supposed to cover all of genesis in about two more weeks um that's okay we can do it uh, I'll do it. So the fall, so we're created. God puts us in a garden. Uh, he gives us a, a spouse. There's man and woman, husband and wife. There's jobs to do. There's all sorts of things. There's a tree that we're not supposed to eat from, uh, that we do eat from. And I should say that for the, for the, for the fathers and, and, and for us as well, it, it's hard hard to overstate how important what we would call typology is. They would call it theoria or like uh, contemplation. Um, in the east they would call it that. In the west they would call it allegory. We call it typology. It's very, very difficult to overstate how important this is to the, to the thought of the fathers. And I, I, I hope to our thought too because I think it's super important. You have things like Adam, and since we're Christians and we're looking back, he's, this is the first Adam. He's the type of Christ, who is the second Adam, right? You've got Eve. She is a type of Mary uh, or the church for a variety of reasons I'll talk about. Uh, there's when Adam goes to sleep, to have the rib taken out of him, that's a type of Christ's death on the cross. Um, Eve is taken out of, the, out of Adam's side. The church is taken out of Christ's side. You know, there's types. The tree, there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's the cross. You know, the, all of these things are seen as types. 
And uh, like I say, it's probably impossible to say um, how important this is to, to understanding the Old Testament. But I'll try. <laughs> um, let me just, you know what, I've got about five minutes. Let me, let me just do this. So we have, we have Adam, who is a type of Christ. He's set in a garden. Christ is raised from the dead. He's mistaken for a gardener, like Adam was a gardener. Um, all men are, all men die through the disobedience of Adam. Men live through the obedience of Christ. Uh, God puts Adam to sleep, removes Eve from his side. I even had a visual, a visual aid for this. Um, this is, this is a, a print, a lino cut, which is not a stamp, by the way, <laughs> but it's, yeah, this is not a stamp, better than that, but, uh, so you've got Adam, who's asleep, Christ, who's dead, Eve is taken from the side of Adam, from his rib, the church, in the form of blood and water, baptism and Eucharist, come from the side of Christ, you have to become Christ's bride, through being baptized, through taking Eucharist, we fell by what our first parents ate. We're made alive again by what we eat. You know, uh, death came into the world through eating the wrong fruit. Life comes back into it through eating the body and blood of Christ in Eucharist. Um, there's a tree here. There's a tree here. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, a husband and a, and a wife, uh, a bride and a, and a groom. This is, Adam says, this is now flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. We're of the body of Christ. We're of the same body of Christ. So we're flesh of his flesh, blood of his blood. So lots and lots and lots of parallels. We're supposed to see this story as our own story as well. Um, the, the Bible talks about Eve being built from Adam's rib, from his side. Uh, the church is being built by the sacraments. So when you read this story, just read about it. Re read it with New Testament eyes. I think there's value in reading it like, like an Old Testament person would read it, you know, just to sort of get into their head a little bit. But we're not. I mean, we see things that they don't see, that they didn't see. We understand things they didn't understand. Like, uh, from, what, from my reading, I don't know this firsthand, but evidently the Jews never thought of the fall as that, I mean, it was a big deal, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Not really. It was just another example of men failing to live in covenant with God. That's it. It was not a cosmic event. When the Apostle Paul comes along, St. Paul says, yes, all men die in Adam. Like, this is a cosmic event. And then the, the church ever since then has, said, has gone back to the fall, which in the Old Testament, to Old Testament Jews wouldn't have made sense to talk about it like that. So we do think differently than Jewish people would think for sure. They wouldn't read as much into that as, as we do. But I see that it is 10 o'clock, uh, or it's 9.58. Does anybody have any questions or angry rants that they want to direct at me? <laughs> I'll take any of them. <laughs> How many people are here? Yeah. Well, you said about the 80 people, so they were hit by 85 people, but the other day, actually, there was 85 attending the meeting. Yeah, it is correct, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. And yeah. Thank you for what you do. Sure. Sure. Yeah. If you go home and grumble, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 